Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. So I was wanting to prepare a video and go over a new quote, uh, hopefully finding something that I hadn't seen before and I've gotten so many emails. And so I just did a search in my inbox for quote and I came across this one. This is from September of last year. <laughs> and I hope you guys understand, I cannot, I, I just cannot get to all the emails. It's, it's too much. I, got, I get a lot of emails, but uh, I realized maybe I can start to do this, try and search for like key things. So I came across this email from David Atchison, quotes and scriptures for a spreadsheet, gathering millennium uh, plus with references. Hey, Jared, it's been a while, but I wanted to get this to you. I've been watching and sharing your channel as best I can. I have had a lot of thanks for sharing, so you're doing a good job. Here's some quotes with references and scriptures on topics, including the kingdom of God, millennial condition, and various topics. And then I'll just, I'll stop right there. He, he then uh, provides a few PDFs. And so I was just kind of like going through these and uh, some of them I have other ones. No, I haven't gone through all of them, but I came across this one. So first of all, thank you, David, for sharing my channel. Thank you for the email. I'm sorry that only now uh, in June of 2024, am I getting to this? Um, and by the way, he has a channel called Gospel Cultural Hall Channel, uh, and here it is right here. I'll put a link for it in the description box below, so make sure to support him and check out his content. And uh, I'll show you what I found. Okay, so we're going to uh, an Ensign article from June 1980. This is Bruce R. McConkie. It's called, This Generation Shall Have My Word Through You. And this is something... I don't know. This this is new. This is like new to me. Something uh, I never really thought about before. So, okay, from DNC chapter or section five, verse ten. This generation shall have my word through you. Joseph Smith has given the word, and we echo the message. And a great part of the message is that every one of us, every one of us, equally precious, has power to get in tune with the Holy Spirit. And learn personally what the prophet receives. Let me just pause right here. He's not saying that you're going to receive revelation for the church. <clears throat> if there's like some new thing, some new uh, practice or doctrine or even scripture or something like that for the church, it comes through the prophet. We receive personal revelation, things having to do with you, your family, your calling, stuff like that. So don't get that confused. But you can essentially have a testimony. You can receive witness that what the prophet teaches is true. Uh, same with the Book of Mormon and everything else. All right, continuing. Now look at this though. Look, there is going to be a day. It is millennial. Okay. So in the millennium, I have to like really like point this out because my first time reading this, I was, I was kind of like a little confused, but there is going to be a day. It is millennial the ancient prophets, uh, Jeremiah for one, foretold it, quote, when no man needs say to his neighbor, know ye the Lord, for all shall know him, from the least to the greatest. And then there's a reference for history of the church, volume three, page 380, uh, which we're going to look at that. But this is a scripture from uh, Jeremiah. <clears throat> all right, continuing. The prophet Joseph Smith said, that this promise has reference to personal revelation to a visitation of the Lord to an individual. Okay. So in the millennium, having, having like personal visitations from the Lord. Now you might say, well, of course, because Christ is going to be here in the millennium. Well, let's just remember this. This is from Joseph Smith. You can find this on the Joseph Smith papers. Uh, here's the reference right here. Okay, Joseph Smith said <clears throat> to Judge Adams that Christ and the resurrected saints will reign over the earth, but not dwell on the earth. Visit it when they, uh, visit it when, sorry, visit it when they please or when necessary to govern it. There will be wicked men on the earth during the thousand years. The heathen nations who will not come up to worship will be destroyed. Now, remember, I copied this over exactly how it was on the Joseph Smith papers. So sometimes there's um, typos, misspellings, uh, the grammar's off. 
Okay. So Christ in this in the resurrected saints are not always going to be here. And it really seems like what uh, Bruce R. McConkey is saying about this scripture from Jeremiah and what Joseph Smith is saying is that you can have personal um, visitations from Christ. Now, I don't think that that's only millennial, and I'm going to show you why in just a minute. Um, it has to do with the idea of the first comforter and the second comforter, the first one being the Holy Ghost, the second one being Christ himself. Okay, so, but let me just go ahead and develop this. Okay, so what I wanted to do, I wanted to look into this further. I wanted to go actually see what Joseph Smith said in History of the Church. Um, although History of the Church, uh, you can use it as a resource, but it's basically a compilation of other primary sources. So if you want to get down to the original source, you have to go to uh, places like this, the Joseph Smith papers. And in this case, what we're about to read has been recorded by William Richard, or sorry, Willard Richards and Wilford Woodruff. And I compared the two. Uh, they appear to me verbatim. So they both recorded the exact same thing. So I'm just going to read this one. This is from a uh, this is the report as reported by Willard Richards, a discourse by Joseph Smith, and it's about the doctrine of election. You can see it here to the left, like that's how he titles this section in, in the journal or in his notes. Um, let me just give you like a explanation of this really quick. What is the doctrine of election? It's not the same as the doctrine of having your calling and election made sure. The doctrine of election has to do with with the pre-mortal life. The doctrine of having your calling and election made sure has to do with this life. Okay. It's essentially in this life, the calling and election made sure it's the assurance that you are good to go. You, you will achieve exaltation. Uh, even not having completed your mortal life, you're good to go. And I'm sure that many, if not all of the general authorities probably receive that at some point. I can't say that for sure. But the doctrine of election takes us all the way back to the pre-mortal life. So another way you can think of it is foreordination. Um, so just for example, this is from Bruce R. M Bruce R. McConkie. May I say that there is no chance in the call of these brethren to direct the Lord's work on the earth. His hand is in it. And he goes on to talk about the fact that they were chosen before this world even existed. And the same with you. Like, you you aren't just randomly placed into random families or um, born into the covenant or in a place where you can receive the gospel. Um, this was all foreordained. Or, sorry, all foreordained. Although, although, it doesn't matter who you were in the pre-mortal life. We all have um, trials and obstacles and a probation that we have to go through. And some people essentially lose their standing because even though they were incredible in the pre-mortal life, well, this is a completely different phase of existence and uh, not everybody stays true. And on the flip side, some people, uh, they rise to the occasion and they accept the gospel in this life in its entirety. So so essentially, there was a pre-mortal uh, Israel, for example, and you come here and it's according to that order that you're born into the family that you are. Um, but you don't necessarily stay Israel through this life. You can lose it. And other people that didn't have it before, they can gain it. So we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Let's get back to let's get back to this. Okay. St. Paul exhorts us to make our calling and election sure. This is that sealing power spoken of by Paul in other places. See Eph Ephesians uh, 1, 13, 14 in whom ye also trusted that after ye heard the word of truth, <coughs> sorry, the, the word of truth, uh, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our, the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. That we may be sealed up unto the day of redemption, this principle ought in its proper place be taught. For God hath not revealed anything to Joseph, but what he will make known unto the twelve, and even the least saint uh, may know all things as fast as he is able to. Right? So everything that's been revealed, you can gain a testimony of it. You can know that it's true. 
the law of tithing. You live it, and it becomes pretty apparent if you're doing it for the right reasons. Like your heart is in it, you're you're doing it according to the spirit of the law, not just because you have to. It becomes pretty apparent that uh, it is a true principle in everything else. All right, continuing. Um, For the day must come when no man need say to his neighbor, Know ye the Lord, for all shall know him who remain. Okay, that's pretty key right there, who remain. What does that mean? Who remain after the burning, after the wicked are destroyed at the time of the second coming. So this is a pretty important distinction because he's talking specifically about after the second coming and in the millennium, right? The scripture that he's referring to is from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the great, sorry, <coughs> unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive them their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Okay? So this is like a millennial thing. Um, and, ju- and just to like solidify that, um, I just pulled up a, up a couple quick um, discourses in the Scripture Citation Index where uh, this Scripture is mentioned. So, for example, this is from George Q. Cannon in Journal of Discourses. Uh, he was a member of the First Presidency. He says, But the prophets have predicted that a time shall come when our race shall be emancipated from these evils, and when there shall be nothing to hurt or destroy in all the holy mountain of the Lord, when swords shall be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, when nation shall no longer rise against nation, and war shall be learned no more. The prophets have, pred- have predicted that the time shall come when the knowledge of the when the knowledge of God shall cover the earth as the waters cover the mighty deep, and and when man need no longer say to his neighbor, "Know ye the Lord," but when all shall know him from the least unto the greatest, there is no doubt that if anything in the scriptures is true, these predictions are, in that they will be verified to the letter. Okay, so here he's clearly talking about Jeremiah. 31 verse 34 in the context of the millennium. Okay, I just really want to get this established. Here, here's another one from Charles W. Penrose. Um, you know what? No, I'm not going to read it, but I'll put I'll put the link for it in the description box below in case you want to check it out, or you can just pause and you can read this. But Charles W. Penrose, he was also a member of the first presidency. And there's more. I'm not going to bring up every instance of it, but I just want it to be clear that. Uh, what Joseph Smith is talking about here is it is clearly in reference to the millennium. Uh, he says so himself, where he says, "Who the, those who remain?" Okay. How is this to be done? It is, be, is it is to be done by this sealing power and the other comforter spoken of, which will be manifest by revelation. There is two comforters spoken of. One is the Holy Ghost the same as given on the day of Pentecost, in that all the saints receive after faith, repentance, and baptism. This first comforter, or Holy Ghost, has no other effect than pure intelligence. It is more powerful in expanding the mind, uh, enlightening the understanding, and storing the intellect with present knowledge of a man uh, who is the literal seed of Abraham than one that is a Gentile, though it may not have half as much visible effect upon the body. For as the Holy Ghost falls upon one of the literal seed of Abraham, it is calm and serene, and his whole soul and body are only exercised by the pure spirit of intelligence. While the effect of the Holy Ghost upon a Gentile is to purge out the old blood and make him actually of the seed of Abraham. That man that has none of the blood of Abraham, naturally, must have a new creation by the Holy Ghost. In such a case, there may be more of a powerful effect upon the body, invisible to the eye, than upon an Israelite, while the Israelite at first might be far more the Gentile in pure intelligence. So let me just stop right here. So we're talking about this like now. So you had a pre-mortal Israel 
and a pre-mortal organization. I'm sure there were lots of different categories of people, uh, nations and tribes maybe. Who knows how things actually were. But there was a pre-mortal um, Israel, right? And because God is a God of order, there is an order in this life. When it comes to our bodies, our bodies are really important. It's one of the primary primary reasons why we came to this life is to get a body. And there's this order um, among these bodies, right? But just because you're born um, of a certain bloodline does not ensure that you'll achieve exaltation. And you can easily fall from that. We've seen that with King David. We saw it with Judas and many other people, right? But... The Lord does things according to an order. Um, <clears throat> I've covered this before. Uh, we're looking at my my spreadsheet called Quotes A through Z. Uh, this is called Patriarchal Blessings. Am I literally descended through Israel or am I adopted? And uh, it might surprise you if you haven't seen this before. Let me just show you a few examples. This is Bruce R. McConkie. In Mormon doctrine, he says, nearly every member of the church is a literal descendant of Jacob who gave patriarchal blessings to his 12 sons, predicting what would happen to them in their posterity after them. Uh, there's more. Here's Brigham Young. Uh, the set time has come for God to gather Israel and for his work to commence upon the face of the whole earth. And the elders who have arisen in this church and kingdom are actually of Israel. Take the elders who are now in this house and you can scarcely find one out of a hundred, but what is of the house of Israel? It has been remarked that the Gentiles have been cut off, and I doubt whether another Gentile ever comes into the church or into this church. Uh, later on, he says, uh, he talks about the fact that Joseph Smith was a pure Ephraimite. Um, he talks about how families are mixed. He says, take a family of 10, for instance, and you might find nine of them purely of Gentile stock, and one son or daughter in that family who was purely of the blood of Ephraim. It was in the veins of the father or mother and was reproduced in the son or daughter, while all the rest of the family are Gentiles. Now, this obviously would, I think, uh, go beyond what we know about inheritance and DNA, uh, unless there's some aspect of DNA that we don't currently understand. Uh, for example, the junk DNA, um, I think they're called telomeres and they shorten over time. And that's what ultimately causes us to die from old age is the shortening of telomeres. Uh, let me know in the comments if you know more about that. But um, anyway, I think there's things that we don't know uh, about um, our physical bodies, things that maybe science does not yet understand that has to do with this. So whatever the case. Uh, you can have like mixed families, like some members that are actually of Israel and others that are not. Um, he says this, Joseph said that the Gentile blood was actually cleansed out of their veins and the blood of Jacob made to circulate in them. So he's talking about, he's talking about a few, no, I missed this part. Again, if a pure Gentile firmly believes the gospel of Jesus Christ and yields obedience to it, in such a case, I will give you the words of the prophet Joseph. When the Lord pours out the Holy Ghost upon that individual, he will have spasms, and you would think that he's going into fits. Joseph said that the Gentile blood was actually cleansed out of their veins, which is what we were just reading on the Joseph Smith papers, and the blood of Jacob made to circulate in them. And the revolution and change in the system were so great that it caused the beholder to think they were going into fits. And then there's more. So, so you get the idea. It's not unfair to anybody, but there is an order. And in this life, no matter what you did in the premortal life, uh, it, your destiny is your own. But there is a physical order to, order to things. And if you're pure Gentile, which none of us can actually know, because uh, we don't have like a science to back this up. But if you if you are, then your blood gets changed in some kind of way, whether that's your actual blood or whether it's DNA or some other thing that we don't understand. But there is an order. Uh, but you literally do become Israel in a very real sense. But beside that, it seems that the majority of the church is Israel. Like, again, here's another one from Joseph Fielding Smith. The great majority of those who become 
members of the church are literal descendants of Abraham through Ephraim, son of Joseph. Uh, those who are not literal descendants of Abraham in Israel must become such. So, okay. So let's get back to this. Let's get back to what we were reading. Okay. Effect of the Holy Ghost upon a Gentile is to purge out the old blood and make him actually of the seed of Abraham. That man that has none of the blood of Abraham naturally must have a new creation by the Holy Ghost. In such a case, there may be more more of a powerful effect upon the body and visible to the eye than upon an Israelite, when the Israelite at first might be far uh, before the Gentile in pure intelligence. Referring to the Holy Ghost, not that you're smarter or have a higher IQ, but just like spiritual intelligence. Okay, the other comforter, so we just talked about the Holy Ghost as the first comforter. Now we're talking about the second comforter. And based on what we said, what we saw, Bruce R. McConkie says in, in the scripture that he quotes from um, Jeremiah, it seems that he's referring to the millennium at this point. The other comforter spoken of is a subject of, of great interest and perhaps understood by few of this generation. After a person hath faith in Christ, repents of his sins, and is baptized for the remission of his sins, and receives the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, which is the first comforter, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and living by every word of God, and the Lord will soon say unto him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. And this is, of course, a calling election made sure. And when the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards. And let me just stop right there. Uh, I think that's key. And, th and that's kind of a scary phrase, at all hazards. Because you think about those times in your life where, like normally, you might do really good with your like contention, how you treat people, um, you know, obeying the law, whether it's the, the law of the land or, or God's laws. But then when things get tough, that's like when you really, I think, prove yourself. You know, if you're in a difficult situation and you get angry at everybody, you, you can't control your temp temper. That's something that I've uh, had an issue with, by the way. Um, or you're destitute, maybe, and it's no fault of your own. You know, do you break the law um, to get ahead or to, you know, whatever? So I, I think that that might be one of the keys uh, to getting your calling election made sure. I'm not saying that for sure, but Joseph Smith is talking about doing your absolute best. And no matter what the circumstances in your life, you still obey God's law. And after some uh, threshold, which we don't know for sure, only the Lord knows how far away you are or how close, then you uh, receive your calling election made sure. So anyway, um, when the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is, is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling election made sure. Okay, then... It will be his privilege to receive the other comforter, which is the Lord, uh, hath promised the saints as is received in the in the testimony of St. John in the 14th chapter from the 12th to the, to the 27th verses. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you, and I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So th this is like very literal stuff. Comfort, talk, you know, second comforter, I will come to you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me, <laughs> me shall be loved by my of my father. I will love him, will manifest myself to him, like in a very literal sense, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, what is this other comforter? It is no more or less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself 
and this is the sum and substance of the whole matter. And sorry, that when any man uh, obtains this last comforter, he will have the personage of Jesus Christ to attend him or appear unto him from time to time. And even he will manifest the Father unto him, and they will take up their abode with him, and the visions of heaven will be opened unto him. The Lord will teach him face to face, and he may have a perfect knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And this is the state and place the ancient the ancient saints arrived at uh, when they had such glorious visions. Oh, sorry, when they had such glorious vision, Isaiah, Ezekiel, John upon upon the Isle of Patmos, uh, St. Paul in the third heavens, and all the saints who held communion with the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which is essentially that portion of the church that is worthy of exaltation because, unfortunately, there there are wheat and tares in the church. There are some people that are celestial bound. There are some people that are terrestrial bound. There are some people in the church that are telestial bound. There's even some that are son of perdition bound, like uh, Judas. So, okay, the spirit of revelation is in connection with these blessings. A person may profit by noticing the first intimation of the spirit of revelation. For instance, when you feel pure intelligence flowing unto you, it may give, give you sudden strokes of ideas that by noticing it, you may find it fulfilled the same day or soon. Uh, I.e., those things that were present presented unto your minds by the Spirit of God will come to pass. And thus, by learning the Spirit of God and understanding it, you may grow into the principle of revelation until you become perfect in, in Christ Jesus. Okay? So... So he talks about the concept of the first comforter. You get that uh, after you're baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then if you endure and you do everything, no matter the circumstances, you don't you don't buckle under the pressure. You don't give yourself like these allowances, like or justifications or exemptions. You know you're thoroughly committed to living this way to to living the gospel and you put God first always, then at some point, uh, it could happen to you. I don't know how often it happens. Maybe it's not very common. It doesn't seem to me like it's very common, but what do I know? Um, I have reason to believe that, at, at the very least, the prophet and apostles probably have this happen to them. Um, as to the rest of us, I don't know. But the exciting thing is uh, Bruce R. McConkie seems to be suggesting that this will maybe be more common in the millennium. You know, I, I don't know. That's what he says here. Let's read what he says again. Okay. DNC 510. This generation shall have my word through you. Joseph Smith has given the word and we echo the message. And a great part of the message is that every one of us is uh, equally precious, has power to get in tune with the Holy Spirit and learn personally what the prophet receives. There's going to be a day. It is millennial. The ancient prophets, Jeremiah for one, foretold it. When no man need say to his neighbor, Know ye the Lord, for all shall know him, from the least to the greatest. The prophet Joseph Smith said that this promise has reference to personal revelation, to a visitation of the Lord to an individual. Or in other words, the second comforter. So there you go. As if the second com- or as if the second coming in the millennium wasn't exciting enough with everything that we know that the whole world will see Jesus Christ um, there's going to be peace uh, our bodies are going to change the earth itself is going to change uh, we're going to have those that have passed on that have been resurrected uh, if, if they're worthy of a, the of a celestial resurrection um, we'll see them later on in the millennium. Those that are terrestrial will be resurrected, but you get the idea. I, it's really hard to fully um, understand what things are going to be like in the millennium, <laughs> you guys. I, I don't know, even as much as we talk about it on this channel or you or I think about it, I don't think that we can fully understand what's about to happen. And this seems to be just another thing 
that more people, uh, it, it sounds like, um, are going to be having these second comforter experiences. That's exciting. And you might ask, well, how does that happen? Because if it's going to be happening to everybody, you know, is Christ able to go to every single person? Like, you know, there is a limited amount of time. But, you know, once you're a celestial being, uh, we know that God does not experience time the same way that we do, that he is over time. Uh, he, all time is present before him. So there, there may be things about physics that we don't understand where uh, it wouldn't make sense to our understanding, but it's like, no, he can totally do that. He can do that. It's not really a matter of time uh, as we know it. So I don't know. Uh, again, as to the number of people that uh, receive this, receive their calling and election made sure before the second coming, I know that it has happened. I just don't know how many, and I don't think it's common. And probably once it does happen, you're probably not supposed to talk about it. And because you're obedient, uh, you don't let it slip because you're a very obedient person. So who knows? I don't know. Um, but yeah, well, that's it for this one. So uh, thanks again, David. I'll check out the other uh, quotes as I, as, as I get time to. But thank you for the email. Um, if you guys haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.